Jack, you're the Shattuck Professor of Law here at the law school, author of The Terror Presidency, and someone who lived through many of the moments uh, described here. And uh, is it right that you ran the Office of Legal Counsel, the president's lawyer's lawyer, whose purpose is to advise on exactly these matters? Uh, it is true, I did. <laughs> So yes, as, as you were watching this film, I don't know why this sounds like a cross-examination. Exactly. <laughs> it's not meant to be. Um, as you were watching this film, what were you thinking? Um, it's the second time I've seen the film, and this version was more powerful than the earlier, uh, less, I think, the less developed version was. I went into government um, not, being, not knowing much or not having thought much about government secrecy. And I did a lot of things in secret when I was in the government. Most of the things I did, almost all the things I did concerned classified information. And I was too busy in the government to, um, to reflect upon uh, the secrecy system. But I have to say, in reflecting on it since, I think it is, um, I've come to think it's the most corrosive uh, uh, aspect of our government and the thing most corrosive to our democracy. I think this is obvious. And I think the film captured just perfectly the uh, pathologies of the secrecy system and the um, paradoxes of the secrecy system. We must have it, and yet it's the worst thing we can have. Um, I've actually become something of a hawk, I guess, against secrecy in the government. I think that uh, this is an area where President Obama said that we, in his inauguration speech, something to the effect that we don't have to trade off liberty and security. I actually don't think that's true in a lot of areas, but this is one area where we can have enormous, enormous improvements in minimizing the secrecy system, but actually enhance our national security. And I, so the, the one thing the film doesn't do, however, and I think it's really hard, is to offer prescriptions mm -hmm. about how you balance these trade-offs. There are two types of big picture questions. One is, um, how do we design a better and maybe optimal system for minimizing secrecy, keeping secret the things that really should be secret, uh, giving the proper incentives to keep those, to make things secret that should be, and not giving terrible uh, over incentives to keep things secret. And then two, and I actually think there's, there's a lot of good ideas about how to do that. The hard part is how to implement it because no one in the government has much of an incentive to do it. That's the problem. So you didn't talk much about prescription. It's really hard. It's really hard to capture in a film. But I thought you captured the trade-offs and the paradoxes and pathologies just brilliantly. I really commend you. Thank you. I can die happy. <laughs> <laughs> and you will. And I will. <laughs> I hope you do. Die happy, that is. I mean, one thing to say about a prescription and that it's come up is um, uh, there is a, a bill coming to Congress this year, we think, um, by Senator Specter, uh, sponsored by Senator Specter, and Kennedy that would require, I don't know if, if this has been, if this is something you all know, but that would require um, the government to show what's a secret if they claim the state secrets privilege, that somebody would have to look at it. Um, it would have to be shown to the courts or somebody with clearance. It couldn't just be claimed and that was enough. And that would be, that would be part of something that would go a long way to helping, I think. I think it would, that would help a bit on the state secrets privilege, but the state secrets privilege is it's in a very important part of the secrecy system, but it's a very small part of the secrecy system. It's gotten much more prominence during the Bush administration, but it's actually been going on for you know, a while. And, um, but that comes up when something reaches court, and that comes up after we found out something that leads us to take someone to court. There's so much, so much just unbelievable overclassification of information that tweaking the state secrets privilege would, would never get at. There's, there's a Moynihan report in the 1990s um, that is really, I, I just commend it to you, just type in Moynihan Report Secrecy that you must have read. Yes. Uh, and, and, and I thought it's prescriptions. It lays out seven or eight things that could be done. It wouldn't solve all the problems, but it would cut out a lot of the unnecessary secrecy. That, and um, so I think we, we actually know, and one of the things is minimizing the state secrets privilege, but there's other things we have to do in terms of how things are classified, how things get declassified, who gets to classify, what the criteria for classification are. Um, that all that stuff needs to be fixed. And we kind of know what we need to do to make progress, but I mean, and this administration, I mean, Podesta was on that commission, I think. That's right. Mm -hmm. And he understands the evils of secrecy. So maybe there's hope, but you know, every president promises to have a more open government and then doesn't do a very good job of doing it. So, but I, but, so I think that that's an important um, 
uh, innovation, but I, doesn't th I don't think it gets at the heart of the secrecy problem. I mean, one of the things that I think we came to feel very strongly in the making of the film was that secrecy always accrues power to the people that hold it. I mean, and that the temptation to aggrandize power by increasing secrecy, whether it's individual or uh, a department or an agency or a uh, branch of the government, I mean, at, at every level of, and every scale from the individual all the way up, you have the temptation to keep people from interfering. Right? Like the example that General Groves offers us inadvertently in, the, in, in, in justifying why he wants to have the secrecy. And he lists the Japanese and the Germans and the Russians, and then he says, and we have to keep it secret from Congress because they could interfere with what we want to do. And I think that that, that sense of secrecy as a way of stopping inquiry, stopping objection, stopping the check of power is, is in some sense, at a, at a sort of broader level, what, what are the things that's, that's hardest to combat because it keeps coming back. And you know, we try all sorts of procedures, limiting the time that secrets can be kept secret at the, at the back end, limiting the number of people who can classify at the front end. I mean, there have been lots of procedural attempts, but it's tough given the overarching drive towards the aggregation of power that secrecy seems to, to afford. Professor Minow, within a uh, kaleidoscopic set of scholarship, among other things, you've written about truth and reconciliation commissions and the capacity of a society to be able to own up to what it might have done and whether that actually leads to a path forward. I sure. open to you. What, what was your reactions to the film? Well, I've seen the film many times, but I have to say this time, I was actually struck by, more by the arguments for secrecy than I have been in the past. I think you've added some more material on that. And you know, the, the, the cell phones, uh, Osama bin Laden's story, is really devastating. It is completely devastating. And what I was thinking was that the media plays this crucial role as watchdog. And yet, in part, um, when there is more trust in the government, they can actually understand better what the line should be. And at the moment, we've had a government that has betrayed the trust, and so there's no reason to believe anything anyone in the government says. And I, I actually think that a more responsible partnership between the media and the government could be developed if there was more openness by the government. And so that then when there's an argument, this really needs to be kept secret, people would believe it. So that's one thing I felt uh, very much watching at this time. Two other things. One, uh, again, very much moved by the arguments for our security, and yet thinking that there needs to be a disaggregation of the issue of accountability and publicity. Because accountability often is helped by publicity, but it, publicity is not the only way to have accountability. And the numbers of ways in which, again, the government, for the reasons that Peter says, the desire for power, the desire to cover up mistakes, all of those things, shields uh, internal decisions from review, second guessing, another eyes. All of that could be done with behind a veil. And to some extent, that's what the FISA court is supposed to do. And that's what there are institutions, including in-camera proceedings in court, that are designed to be able to provide accountability while maintaining secrecy. But the incentive that so many people have is don't look, don't look, don't look, including, you know, recently under the FISA courts, we're not even going to go, we're not even going to go. So somehow I guess I think it would be really helpful if there was an insistence on accountability even when there is a justification for privacy and secrecy. And the last thing I'd say is in the vein of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it has struck me that um, one of the dangers uh, of any kind of secrecy regime is that the justifications offered to ourselves about why we need secrecy are never revisited. We never look at it again. Were we right? Did we make the gamble correctly? And so somehow there needs to be kept a story, kept the materials, so that when the time comes and it's possible to look back, it actually can be reviewed. And I guess I feel that uh, even now, even now in this country, we need to somehow make sure that there isn't a massive shredding of material all of those things that need to be kept separate, secret, keep them secret, but somehow make them available to be opened later on. I wanted to ask Jack a question about that 
particular question because it's come up a lot about issues of, say, presidential daily briefs, what the president gets every day about what the threat environment is, what do they know, what are they thinking about. Clearly, those have to be kept secret for a long time. I mean, just to give people the room to make decisions and to think clearly without so much scrutiny. But in Martha's point, if they were, say, after 25 years or some amount of time made available, is that a good thing or is that not a good thing? I think it's a good thing, unambiguously a good thing after a certain amount of time. There are very few things, there are lots of different reasons, we, we, and you, you actually touched on a lot of them in the film for keeping things secret, and different reasons for keeping things secret may justify different time periods for keeping them secret. But after a certain period of time, um, I think it is crucially important that it be revealed. And you'd be surprising what, surprised what would be revealed in, in both directions. I mean, the, the Rob Silberman Commission on Weapons of Mass Destruction had this wonderful paragraph where it said, and this, is, this included people like Patricia Wald on the commission and Senator Rob. This was, it was a, a bipartisan commission. And, and talking about secrecy and the problem of leaks, it said there are, in effect, it said there are, in the last you know, so and so years, we've had hundreds of, we've, we've had you know, dozens and dozens of leaks that have caused hundreds and hundreds of million dollars of damage and countless damage in our relations with others and in tipping off our enemy and the like. And the evidence for this was, of course, in a classified annex. They couldn't explain, they couldn't provide evidence. This is part of the problem, actually. I think that a lot of people don't believe, with quite understandably, that there's a problem with leaks. Because you see the leak and you don't, you've done a good job of coming up with a few of the examples where we know that something leaks and then the information that we have about the enemy stops. People in the intelligence community, community, as some of the people you saw, think it's a much, much greater problem than they've been able to reveal. But those secrets stay lodged forever. So I think, so I, I think that we can have a lot, lot more openness about past events. Um, and I think they would be revealing both about the mistakes the government made, things they should have done, but it also would be revealing about how, how um, costly the secrecy system and the leaks that are caused by the secrecy system are. And one more thing about, if I could just say about accountability. Um, I agree with Martha that um, there are ways to have accountability in secret and even minimal scrutiny. I mean, people say the FISA court is not much of a check on the executive branch, and that's just not true because they approve 99% of the applications or something. The work that goes in mm -hmm. to ensuring that they say yes and, and to having to convince another set of eyes has an enormous ex ante effect on the quality of the deliberation. Uh, the same thing with informing the intelligence committees. If, I'm convinced that most of the really unfortunate legal analysis and rhetoric in some of the most harmful memoranda that came out of the Justice Department never, ever would have happened. And we would all have been spared much pain and damage as a country if just another set of eyes had looked at that in another institution. And so I think there are ways of, uh, I mean, I think there can be accountability of things that are gen for things that are genuinely secret. The problem is we also learned this in the last eight years those depend on the good faith of the executive branch because you can only have another set of eyes if the executive branch shows another set of eyes. And we learned that it's very hard to, to legislate that. They have to want to do it. They can keep things from the other set of eyes that they want and make terrible mistakes. So I agree that in theory that accountability, and you can have a form of such substitute accountability in secret. It's not perfect, but it's a lot better than people think. But it's, it's hard to enforce if the executive doesn't want to do it. I just want to comment on one thing that each of you have said. And one of the people who wrote the reports on the leaks was Jim Bruce, who's in the film. He wrote his classified CIA report examining what leaks had happened and how many there were and where they came from and what happened, what were their consequences. And he found, uh, so there's a declassified version of that report, which has been released, and even a redacted version of the classified portion. How recent is that? Um, how recently was it released? I mean, is or is the about, report? Is about, it was a report in the last couple, in yeah. the last five years, I think. So he said that. Um, so he's furious about the press. I mean, he's off the record said, "I want SWAT teams to go after the press." So he's. This is not somebody who likes the press. Was it really off the record? <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said, you know, we, so I so when I was one one time I was talking to him on the phone and I said, "Well, what? Where do most of the leaks come from?" And he said, "Oh." About 80% of them come from the executive branch. Exactly. So I said, well, what, what is the executive branch doing? And he said, these are policy interventions. They leak to yep. get something through that they want to get through. 
So I said, well, if they're 80% are from the executive branch, and, you know, and then of the 20% only a, sm a fairly small fraction from the press, why, why go after them? And he said, well, most of them you can't, because if, if more than sort of two, two, to two people know, you know, or know something, you never get to the bottom of it. So it, it, it turns out to be complicated. And that brings up a question that, that, that Martha was asking about the press, about how in a better political environment the press could function. And um, uh, Gelman in, 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 is, 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 has been back and forth with the administration over time. And he, one of the things that he said, uh, not in the film, is that there was a change over the years. And that in, in, you know, earlier on, or even earlier on in the Bush administration, but in before the Bush administration, you know, if you had a story that involved saying something that had some classified aspect to it, you would go to the officials and say, I'm gonna write this story. It's not that I'm gonna not write this story, but what's the problem? And you know, let's talk about it. So in the case, there's an example of, there's a ring around Washington designed to keep people from bringing in bad radioactive things to, to the city, which we all hope they're trying to stop from happening. So they built this ring, they tested it, and most of the stuff got through. So, he, so Gelman decided to write a story about this. And, he's, and then he called up and, you know, various agencies and said, I'm gonna write this story. And it went all the way up to Condoleezza Rice and, 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 and she said to him, you can't write the story. And he said, well, I'm gonna write the story. Everybody knows you've got checks on, you know, various kinds of radioactive counters. I'm gonna write the story. And she said, well, and then he said, well, what's secret? And they went back and forth and eventually various experts got involved. And they said, what's secret is the particular failure mode. Where, where did these, what actually failed in this? And he said, okay, I can live with that. That's not the important part of my story. I don't need to know that, you know, 6.3 inches of lead didn't find, I mean, no. So, so I think there are lots of cases where you can have good responsible reporting and not get us all killed in a radioactive mess. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, that, that kind of issue seems to me, you know, I don't know if it's solvable as an abstract theorem, but I think in the practical reality of it, if somebody had said, you know, do we have to publish the article in the LA Times that we're raising in the middle of raising a, a dead Russian submarine from the bottom with nuclear materials in it and code books and everything else, that didn't need to be published in the middle of that operation. That's crazy. But, I mean, that's what we pay the CIA to do, is to do things like that. So, but I think on the other hand, you know, when there's, you know, the disclosure about weapons of mass destruction or the torture at Abu Ghraib, I mean, the newspapers should do more of that. And I, I don't think, it doesn't seem to me impossible that responsible reporters can work with responsible government agencies to work it out. I, but I don't know if there's a general solution to it. How much of the disconnect here in your experience in talking to so many people no doubt for hours that didn't make it into the movie, uh, is kind of a cultural or social disconnect and mistrust between them rather than just we can sit down and work this out and surely if we were just arguing it out as an intellectual matter, we could agree. Were there people on the uh, more pro-secrecy side of things who would happily defend the Reynolds case on general cultural principles even though it appeared there was nothing ultimately in there that was uh, it couldn't be released. And on the other hand, are there people from the media establishment who think the satellite phone story was the press doing its job correctly rather than shouldn't have gotten through? I'll, I'll jump in at least to initially respond. <clears throat> um, the Reynolds uh, people, after they read the report, tried to revisit the case and tried to get the Supreme Court to open it up again, and they were, they were turned down. Um, uh, and a lot of the arguments we heard about that and about the Reynolds case was that there's no way to really know what's a secret in that report to our eyes, maybe, but, you know, a B-52 uh, at 20,000 feet, you know, in itself is revealing of something of our capacities that this whole notion of um, not sources but methods gets revealed, you know, inadvertently mm -hmm. in such kinds of... You know, if you see a tank, everybody knows the Russians have a particular tank, and so they put the tank on the front page of the Washington Post. But the angle that they took the picture of that tank shows that they had the capacity for satellites to see at a certain resolution and a certain height, you know, demonstrates that we have this, this method for gaining um, information. And the intelligence community goes crazy when such things get revealed, and the reporters don't know. So the argument from the intelligence community side is that the reporters aren't 
just don't know well enough. They're perfectly well-intentioned. They can read it, and there's nothing apparently so. But buried in that are secrets that we can't know about, and only they can know about. And then once you get to that, once that's said, all conversation stops, because you're basically saying, you can't possibly know. You're an idiot. You know, he says, no, you're the idiot, and then it's, it's all over with. So um, you know, I think, I think that we heard a lot of people say such things and kind of look at us knowingly, like, how can you possibly know? We went, Peter and I went to Langley and tried to talk to the CIA, tried to get CIA to talk to us. And, you know, I can't tell you how dismissive and disinterested they were. These Harvard professors with their stupid ideas. I mean, you know, they couldn't have been dripping more with contempt. Um, and of course, you know, they have Should a job have gone to- gone undercover as a George Mason professor. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but, it, you know, I, the other thing that's good about the CIA is they have a gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to know. And Discount great on stuff. secret documents. It's great today. stuff. Great Little stuff. pens that it's just fantastic stuff. Things that disappear and all kinds of stuff for your kids. Who knew? Who knew? Huh? And on the other side of things, on the on the uh, other side, the yeah, there, there there are people um, who say. I mean, for instance, Tom Tom Blanton believes on 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 various grounds that the satellite story is 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 bogus and that bin Laden would have known anyway that they were awesome. cracking it and maybe it had been published earlier or maybe it was the raid to get it under Clinton where they used cruise missiles to hit one of the Al-Qaeda bases so that would have shown them that it was stupid to use a sat phone even if you weren't decrypting it because you could find out where you were and I mean you know I mean there, so yes there are there are people on the press side who think who've never met a secret that in the end they didn't think really mm. should be disclosed. Mm. And there are people on the government side who thinks that, you know, they've never met a secret that should be disclosed. Right. And, we, and we did hear both of those sides. I mean, in the film, um, Mike Levin from the NSA is pretty close to the view that Rob was citing him saying, you can't know, the press can't know, nobody who's not inside the system This is the, the fellow who held know. the same post at the NSA for about 30 years? Yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. So who's watched the whole thing and he, you know, his view is, you know, there are lots of different kinds of secrets in different agencies also. I mean, now we're classifying infrastructure. I mean, yeah. Garfinkel, who's head of the Information Security Oversight Office, was horrified. He spent his whole career, he ran that office for the whole time, and he was, his job was to try to keep secrecy from getting out of hand in all the different other agencies. And he said he worked all the time to stop infrastructure from being classified. And now infrastructure, because everything is a potential target, everything could be classified, every, every water main, every electrical main, every telephone switch station. I mean, you, you know, once you start down that avenue and Homeland Security begins to classify, you, it mushrooms out like And I take that. it that, that zoom in on Guantanamo Bay that looked like a Google map or Google Earth was in fact blacked out on Google Earth, or you no, blacked no. it out for effect? We did it. We did it. Uh, we blacked it out. Too bad, right? No, it's Peter, kind of cool that there'd be this one little place you couldn't see. Well, like the vice president's, I, president's, president's yeah. That's right. Peter, you've, you've t told me before about how the declassification project was making progress, and now it's totally back. So can you explain that? So in the, in the Clinton administration, there was a big batch declassification order. I mean, a very big effort to get declassified um, unbelievable quantities of billions of, uh, of pages of, of documents and of historically significant documents. It wasn't just, you know, general, uh, you know, general tough guy slept at this hotel on this night and it was classified that night so nobody would, you know, kidnap him. This was really, uh, these were things that were supposed to be of broad significance. And there was, there was a default of declassification that was put into effect through various means, like bringing way down the number of original classifiers, the people that can say, this, you know, it is secret that 97 people are in this room, and then every subsequent document that makes reference to that gets the classification level of the original classifier. So by restricting, it used to be that every, you know, every bird colonel wanted original classification authority and a special authorization for their projects because it became a prestige question, mm. right? I mean, were you, did you have a special named mm. secret project? and could you create the secrets around that? Mm -hmm. So those were highly limited in, in this period, mm -hmm. and that was one thing, and the other was, as I mentioned before, limiting the, you know, on the distal end, how long things would remain secret before they default opened. And then, again, with the Freedom of Information Act, and something that Obama's tried to intervene on early on, in the, early, in the earliest days, was to, say, was to restore what had been the case, which was that, um, originally, was that, that, that things should be open if they can be. And the Bush administration had sort of turned that around and made the default keep it secret unless there's good reason to open it, as opposed to keep it open unless there's good reason to close it. So that, the, in various ways, 
I mean, some of them have to do with the area of classification, like the like infrastructure. Some of them have to do with the default on FOIA, on Freedom of Information Act. Some of them have to do with the um, with, with with areas that are sort of penumbral to secrecy. These restricted but unclassified documents. So now that no one knows what those are, but every agency now has a a category defined in completely legally random ways uh, that say, you know, this report. It's not secret, but we're taking it off the library shelves. And we send an order out to the libraries, like the ones we showed in the film, and say, remove and destroy. And then the librarians have sort of, they, I mean, they have their sort of Asami's dot collections that you know, some of them are trying to sort of keep copies of things, just because librarians don't like burning books. They just don't like it. And um, so, but there's been a struggle over that. But that, we don't even, you know, the, <coughs> we're able to quantify because of the work of the, um, of this, of the office of the Information Security Oversight Office, some idea, although it's hard and in, in a How do they case, tell? Because I, it, s I mean, I saw okay. lots of classifications going on that they never would have known about. They must have some algorithm where they, they make do. And they, right, it's an estimate, yeah. but they, it's, a, it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, right, exactly. but these, but these unclassified but restricted documents, no one has any idea. No one knows the order of magnitude. We have no idea what's been taken off. Um, the Abu Ghraib example is powerful in a number of ways. Um, some lessons people might take from it are the people who engaged in those activities didn't seem to think them very secret. They happily took photos of it and circulated it among family and friends. And a, a, an ancillary point would be, at some point there's a whistleblower. Judge Posner, for example, has weighed in several times on issues of secrecy and been not concerned at all because he says if anything truly terrible is going on, there'll be a whistleblower and see Abu Ghraib as the kind of thing that would show it. I suppose too, the primary argument made as to why those photos should not have been allowed to be public and I guess why there's even a handful of additional photos that still have not been made public are because it would harm the security of the United States for those photos exactly because it's so gripping to get that original document the way that the person who got to see the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact fell over because of it, or the woman who got the report that finally <coughs> confirmed her father was dead in that plane crash, that because of that power is the reason to keep the lid on it. Maybe there could be accountability, as Martha was saying, without having to release those photos, and you can still have a report from General Taguba or somebody <coughs> that says, mistakes were made, bad things happened, we're gonna discipline the following people, but we don't think it's in the interest of the United States to show those photos. And I don't know if there's any reactions or thoughts I'm on the Jack, why don't, do you want to say what yeah. you think? Well, I'm what is the question? Should we show those photos? Should, Should we they show be those classified, I think is Jonathan's question. I, I think you're but, asking, are there reasons to uh, keep secret uh, activities where it's not because it's classified, it's because it actually would be embarrassing or could otherwise impair our strength in the world, our but security. That, that, the test, though, I mean, I, I'm not going to get the exact language, you might know it, for the various degrees of classification are something like, is it? Grave threat, threat, threat to, to the, the national security, national security, security versus a That is an incredibly threat. subjective standard, but it's easy to imagine <clears throat> right. those photographs coming underneath it. Absolutely. Right. I mean, if you could make a, a pretty plausible causal claim that more pictures would lead to certain activities that would, uh, or more terrorists, and that under that definition, it would clearly classify, I think. But this was exactly Nixon's argument, um, that if I do it, it's not illegal because yeah. I'm the president exactly. and I have, to have, I have to have the credibility of the office. You're undermining me, you're undermining right. the, the stability of the United States. But I'm just pointing out that those are the definitions we have and it's, people have had a very hard time coming up with more precise definitions that would get at that. Um, I think it's a hard call. I mean, um, my feeling is that if we think about the content of secrets, we're never going to succeed because what is a secret is technologically and historically and politically constantly changing, right? I mean, who could have thought in, you know, when those laws were being formulated that we would be dealing with the kind of digital world that we're in now? So I think we have to think in terms of these questions of oversight. I mean, what you were saying, another pair of eyes. And I think that though the film isn't prescriptive in a specific legislative way, we do come down pretty strongly on the side of oversight. Because that, it's not that oversight protects you from everything, but we know without oversight it's a disaster. Exactly. So well, it's, a, it's a necessary but not sufficient remedy. So it's oversight, but it's also process, process in the 
in, in what becomes uh, secret, how things become unsecret? Yes. I think that, you know, after Good and Blanton, at the level of prescription, want to argue exactly how you implement this, I have no idea, but they wanted to argue that there has to be a competing force at the moment that secrets are made, that there has to be a kind of argument, some, something, not just, yes, this is a secret, and then stamping it, and it doesn't have to show it, but at that moment, there's some competing element saying, no, that's not a good idea for that to be a secret, just mm -hmm. a moment of that. And I don't know how you do that, given how many secrets there are. I don't know how you actually convene such a thing. But that struck me as very sensible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't we uh, open it up to reaction and questions from the audience? Tell us who you are, if you feel comfortable with that. I, I don't feel comfortable with that. Um, my, uh, sorry, my question's inherently unfair uh, because it involves prognostication. Um, so I beg your pardon if, uh, you know, if this is inappropriate. But um, I'm curious about something that uh, the CIA agent said um, when she, she mentioned that to journalists, the, uh, the game of the secrecy is, is a game or something like this. Um, I'm, I'm curious about it because I also think of journalism as a business and a failing business. Um, and my question has to do with the way that uh, foreign correspondents um, and in-depth reporting um, are uh, being, the budgets are being cut for these activities and uh, traditional media is, uh, I guess, an economic and environmental um, problem. And uh, so what I'm interested in is what your view of the future is. Do you think um, uh, on the question of of accountability that, you know, a legion of, of bloggers, uh, you know, doing very poor journalism, but, you know, their own, you know, kind of cowboy approach is, is going to be a good thing. Um, so I'm interested in kind of a, a, a prediction. Got it. Well, I'll say two things. I mean, just off the top. It seems to be going exactly in both directions. That on one hand, you have this kind of instantaneous response, cell phone, taking pictures of things and putting them on the internet so you know something absolutely instantaneously. Bloggers responding, surrounding a situation, responding very subjectively, not very journalistically, um, creating a kind of sensational and quite interesting and sometimes revealing, but hard to know exactly what you're looking at. On the one hand, on the other hand, you have documentary filmmakers like us plodding along over the years trying to fill in the blanks to make some sense of it. You know, so you have this like instantaneous response and then you have got this four year lag time. And we started secrecy before it was really a big issue and then it became a big issue and, and it was a former, now it's a new administration and we're still showing the movie. And you know, it's like, it would be nice if we could work a little quicker and there were more money, but there isn't and that's the way it is and there's something nice about taking that time. But it seems exactly the opposite of journalism. You know, it's like instantaneous and subjective or long-term and reflective, and there's this big middle that I think is missing and that will be a real problem. And, and that I think is one of the things that the questioner was raising, which is uh, the, the sort of long-form journalism, which is, I mean, being hunted to extinction by the, by, by the market. And one of the things that, I mean, the experience I've had, and I'm sure you, you have too, is that when you first start doing your rounds on the internet of newspapers and you go you know, to the Guardian and you go to the Washington Post, the New York Times, you have this elated feeling that there's this depth of reporting in the world and, you, and then you start to see it's the same story moving around and a story that occurs at you know, 9 o'clock in Haaretz is on spiegel.de at 10.15 and, and then it migrates and it's on the Guardian. And, I mean, you see this just circulation and there's actually not very much, you know, in terms of the the in-depth reporting, not that you know somebody got run over in, 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 in a particular city one day. I mean, that, there is a lot of reporting that's local in that sense. But the, the, these big stories about the sort of structural features of the, the world that we're in, I mean, it's, I think that the, the collapse of the long form of journalism is really serious because derivative from that are all these other things that look independent but aren't. Television news, for instance. Basically, you know, more and more is just reading off the two or three papers of record and then telling you it, you know, reading, telling you what's in the first paragraph. So I think it's pretty, I am worried about that. And I think as Rob says, that, that, that's the space between Rob's extremes, you know, the slow pokes like us and the, and, and the speedy guys who are doing the, the, the quick form blogging. Well, I despair about the loss of a viable business model for investigative reporting, and I don't see a solution other than people starting to have subscriptions. I'll sign up, I'll pay, uh, if a bunch of us get together. And quite seriously, we're gonna have to come up with a business model of that nature. At the moment, the biggest readers of newspapers are other people in newspapers, which is a dwindling group, and that's inadequate. The only hopeful thing that I have seen 
and it's kind of bizarre, is the fact of the internet means that devices of secrecy, including protective orders in the midst of litigation, are easily surpassed by technology. So there's a protective order, someone posts the material on the internet, it's too late, it's over. And there are court orders saying, sorry, there's nothing we can do about the protective order because it's out there, we can never retrieve all the pieces. So that's one beginning mm. kind of opening. Mm. Uh, and then we need people to analyze this stuff that's now appearing on the internet. So one such person is you, Jonathan, who, inter who uh, has this project to understand what parts of the internet are blocked. And is, you know, you've been thinking about secrecy at the level of the, of the web. Do you, have you come to some preliminary, I mean, uh, preliminary conclusions about how effective these, these, these large-scale blockings of internet information are? I think they're ineffective as against people who are bound and determined to get to stuff their government doesn't want them to see. But as to the 80% of the people that if it takes, you know, more than 30 seconds to load your Facebook page, you're going somewhere else for your idle moment of uh, distraction, uh, it's actually highly effective. Um, and that sometimes these technical blocks can be complemented by regimes of self-censorship that get to the questions of patriotism, of, you know, are you wanting, are you down with what uh, the government wants of you uh, when you go to zones that, uh, you know, you're not supposed to see. Chris Segoyan. So Jonathan just outed me, but I'm a fellow at the Berkman Center and a blogger. Uh, I write about security and privacy issues. And I have a question, I guess, about the interplay between whistleblowers and the press. Uh, you know, we depend upon whistleblowers to come forward, but we also depend on members of the press to bring us the stories. Um, the NSA warrantless wiretapping scandal, I think, is most interesting in this area because it was an engineer from AT&T who first went to the LA Times, which sat on the story for a year and then decided not to do anything with it. And then it was finally the New York Times that then sat on the story and then finally did something after the journalist decided to write a book about it. And in both cases, it was because the editors of the newspapers met with people from the White House who said, you know what, this is really bad for national security if you publish this. So it seems like the mainstream press have a monopoly on whistleblowers because whistleblowers come to them. Uh, whistleblowers never come to me as a blogger. Um, and I'm wondering, given the cozy relationship between the executive and the press, how do we make sure that we actually do find out about the stories and that they don't get squelched? Anybody want to grab that? I mean, I'll take a, a little bit of prognostication here. I think they will. I mean, it may not be yet, but I think that as bloggers become better known, you know, it, 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 there, are, there will be bloggers who have uh, the uh, the clout to be an attractive magnet for people who have something that they want to get out when they get stymied by more mainstream and, and, and central press. I mean, that seems, that seems inevitable to me. You know, the question um, is interesting because it, the issue is um, wh what pressures are on, on say, newspapers to not, to not publish. When you say a cozy relationship with the government, I mean, that bears some in, some looking at what you exactly mean by that. But the press is under such pressure, needs its, you know, needs its access to the government, <clears throat> needs its, its, it's just running scared. It can't actually behave independently in the way that blogging can behave independently. Yet blogging has to now gain the sense that it's also responsible as well as independent. And so I think if blogging gains that, um, then I think there will be a way in which who's ever the most, actually the most independent, will get the most news in the ways that you're describing. I think right now we're in a kind of stalemate because the, the mainstream press is just, just, it's just running terrified, as, as well it should. And blogging has yet to gain the respectability of credibility like it's actually doing something responsible. But I agree with Peter that that's about to change. It has to change. There has to be some mechanism for us to get this information, the desire of people to know. I think we'll ultimately win the day, however we get it. We have a thought from back here. Um, actually, I want to just make very quick two points. I don't want to sound like I'm beating on a dead horse, but uh, just to paraphrase a quote from your film, uh, not this time around, not if we left it to the intelligence guys, if we left it to the press, um, we would have till this day believed that Saddam Hussein did indeed possess uh, WMD because they rolled like. They bought up the stuff that the administration was giving them. No one looked at it critically. But 
going here to the point, isn't it, I mean, the, the CIA folks, the uh, intelligence community, that's their culture, keeping everything secret. So I think that um, the, the target or um, it would have been a much more effective way of looking at things is that to ask why our legislators are accepting this. Why are they doing, um, allowing them to get away with this? Because again, just in the run up to the Iraq war, they just accepted whatever the administration gave, uh, gave them uncritically. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my sense is that you know, it's a, it, it, this is something that swings back and forth and that the, you know, the, the, the press was rather critical in the discussions up to the first Gulf War. And I think that that had a lot to do with their reluctance to be critical in the run up to the second Gulf War because they felt that they'd been caught out. Then after it turned out that the weapons of mass destruction as reported by, you know, the bad reporting that went on the front page of the New York Times by Judith Miller, which I thought was just horribly irresponsible, um, what, you know, saying that there were these uranium, um, these aluminum tubes were, were used to make, uh, to sort out uranium-235 from 238, which anybody at Livermore or Los Alamos would have told, well, these were nonsense. These were things for missiles, anti-tank missiles. They, they had nothing to do with uranium centrifuges. And to ha that that was a two-page, a two-column spread on the front page of the Times was terrible. And then, sort of then, in the, and then sort of after that, then they swung back and they became more critical. Um, so I think that there was, there's a kind of uh, oscillatory, lagged back reaction constantly going on with the press. And, you know, I, 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 as I said, in, in the earlier discussion, I, um, I mentioned that I thought that it's very hard to make an abstraction about how the press should, should behave. Um, because so much of it depends on, 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 to the case. But, I mean, so for instance, in the case of the centrifuges, that is a place where a paper of record should have gone to technical experts. They're not hard to find, you know, you dial New Mexico, you find them. I mean, there, there's probably fi 500 people in the, in, at, you know, in and around Los Alamos and Oak Ridge and, and, and Sandia and so on, who could have t got given information to an editor who is checking. I mean, just as the government has to put another pair of eyes on it, the Times should have put another pair of eyes on it. So I think that it is possible to be, for them to be responsible about those stories. In that case, they weren't. But I think the media needs some other eyes. There needs to be a, uh, a media watchdog. You know, something like the Columbia Journalism Review, but it's more splashy, like uh, People Magazine called Secrets uh, or something, that, that, hey. that would get <laughs> enough readership that people would be watching, you know, how is the media doing in, in covering what's been covered up. I suppose up. in the digital world we have liveleak.com and WikiLeaks and uh, other sites that have sometimes been the repository of uh, whistleblowing and other things. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about accountability and specifically about the role of lawyers in this. And um, uh, let's start with the accusation made by one of the women in the film that uh, the government simply decided that this was a good test case the, uh, to classify this report and we would take it up to the Supreme Court. Well, if that's true then, there's some lawyer that signed an affidavit that went to the Supreme Court that said this was a secret document, knowing, in fact, that the document was not secret, which would be a serious ethical violation. Um, and I know there's also been uh, accusations of ethical violations made uh, about uh, not only what was said substantively in some of the torture amendments, but the classification of it. If, for example, we are going to torture suspects, it doesn't seem like that's something we don't want to come out. In fact, it seems like something we do want to come out, right? Because that would perhaps intimidate suspects. So again, it seems like lawyers have a role to play here in enforcing accountability in that we would hope when officials in the executive say, I want this classified, they would say, well, really, we can't do this. Um, so do you think it's, there is some hope to think lawyers will exercise that or is that just a pipe dream that we can't rely on lawyers to I mean, actually I think it's have Jack, any this is for you. <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure of the question. I mean, if you're asking whether lawyers can, I mean, as you were suggesting in the Reynolds case, I'm sure there was an argument about whether there was classified information in that document for reasons you were suggesting. And I know I was a, as a lawyer in the government, I was presented with something that was classified and often, I would say usually, when I saw a classified document, I would wonder why it was classified. But if that's the question you're asking, whether lawyers have a role there, that it's really very hard. They don't have much of a role in questioning classification challenges made by, um, by other folks. And there's usually, um, as I say, most of the classified documents I saw in the government, I was befuddled as to why they were classified. 
But when asked, someone would tell me they would make an argument, and I really wasn't competent to second guess it. It's one of these things where you were don't you understand. Were you told within the government, here's why, or was it? Were you even when told? I asked, no, no, you're yes. not allowed to know. No, I was always told when I was asked because um, I was always told when I was asked. You mean when you asked? When I asked, I was you always, were always told, told yes. what the basis was. Yes, and I wasn't always convinced by that, but. Um, Again, it was just not something I could have second guessed. I didn't, I didn't have any standing to second guess it. Uh huh. And structurally, is the same thing true for, I guess, the claim that someone is an enemy combatant? Uh, I guess the government's original position was that claim could be substantiated by something like an affidavit from an assistant secretary of state and no more. Well, that was a long time ago, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, long, we're, we're long beyond that. That was like there 2004. Are, <laughs> but there are, no, that was more like 2002. But there are. Um, I mean, lawyers in making legal judgments have to take facts as presented to them. Now, I would often, and any good lawyer would, question the basis for the facts. And often, it would be the case that when pressed, the answer wasn't quite what they thought, and I would keep pressing. But at the end of the day, we just, I just didn't have the basis to look behind all the facts or the resources, time or um, or personnel. I wanted to ask a, to say a quick thing about the Reynolds case because. The argument that persuades me that there was nothing in there and that they actually knew there was nothing in there and that they did actually want to, it's, I'm speculating, but this is why I think this. <clears throat> the government argued this case in lower courts and lost like three times before it went to the Supreme Court. And the argument was always, um, if you make us give you the accident report, then we will not be able to get good information for future accident reports when things go wrong, if people are liable, criminally liable for their bad behavior. Um, so we don't want to do that. As you and say, that's an immunity argument more than a secrecy argument. Right, at that right. point, that was the argument. Right. And the courts always said, we understand that, that's important, but the, the claims of the widows trump the argument of the right. government in this way. Right. Um, and then at the end, Kirkpatrick, I think that was his name, said, you know, if you were arguing, I don't know, um, national security, then maybe we would, ha he, wasn't, he wasn't giving them anything. And the only time they argued national security was in front of the Supreme Court at the last moment, and that's what won the day. Right. So it doesn't strike me that the government all along knew and wanted to protect national security and secrecy and that it seems like they found a way to win the argument and to make the right. foundation for the state secrets privilege. Right. I want to come so, back to one thing which yep. seems to me important, which is that within the secret community, whether it's the Department of Energy around nuclear weapons, or whether it's in the CIA, there are people who don't want overclassification. Yeah. And they have a different reason. It's not because they think the discussion of this in general is good for democracy. They think that too much overclassification undermines the ability to protect the real secrets. And we heard that over and over again. We heard that from the former head of Los Alamos. We heard it from the head of security for nuclear weapons, Brian Siebert, who's not in the film. We heard it from Melissa Maley, uh, the, 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 head of the um, chief of base Jerusalem, CIA, also was against overclassification. She was against the classification of what went on in Abu Ghraib. She said, that's a crime. So there are people who don't want it, and they don't want it maybe for another reason, but they don't want it because if you overclassify, nobody respects anything. People will say, oh, you classified my dinner here? You classified, you know, when you, you're in this, a lot of offices, the, you know, the pop-up on the screen is the default is to secret. If that's your experience, seeing a secret document after en enough thousands of these go by you that have no, you know, cheese sandwich is, is yeah. secret, then, you know, you, you say, well, you know, maybe the place where this, yeah. These particular weapons are stored is not a secret, and they happen to be nuclear weapons, and that's a problem. Right. So, I mean, I think that they're, they're, it's not entirely the case that everybody who works in a classified environment is for classifying everything. Yeah. There are people who think about this. The problem is that it's very asymmetric about the decision about what to exactly. release. If you, you know, no one's ever in the history of the universe been fired for overclassifying. Never happened. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, just to repeat, Justice Stewart said in the Pentagon Papers case, when everything is classified, and everything is secret, nothing is secret. And you're right that there are a lot of individuals who quite rightly, I heard Donald Rumsfeld many times yelling at people about overclassification. Why is this classified? This is, you shouldn't be doing this. And there are a lot of people who think that in the government, but the problem is the system creates incentives for overclassification, uh, both on individuals and systemically. And um, so 
the, the whole system needs to be changed. Even and, and it is. There's no doubt that it's damaging to national security to overclassify for precisely the reasons you say, and also because um, I think it makes it easier to leak. So uh, we're at time. I wonder if uh, in the last minute we have to wrap up, you guys have put so much effort into this movie. You've now seen it so many times. You've, you've it's kind of got a path dependence to it. Uh, there might be whole pieces to it that now you would do differently if only you were starting from scratch, which luckily you're not. So I'm just curious, uh, either is there anything you want to share in reactions from participants who helped you make the movie now that they've seen it? Uh, did you get any interesting pushback or reaction? And secondly, was there anything you would actually want to change or wish that you had explored that you, you didn't with the benefit of now having seen it uh, and lived it for so long? I, I can, there's two things maybe that I would love to be in the film that's not in the film. One is that it would have been wonderful to have gotten um, a psychiatrist who works uh, with people from the intelligence community who hold secrets, who, know, who knows intimately the human cost of holding mm. such kinds of Which secrets. Which was hinted at by the uh, Melissa's sham wedding. Yeah. Yes, and it's a hint, but you know, if that mm. could be explored much more fully and humanly in the film, it's something I think we really wanted. Mm. Um, um, and I had something else, but it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> It's already been shredded. You know, we, uh, this question came up all the time in making the film. And we started the film uh, last January, January 08, at Sundance. And we went back at our own expense, put our families into financial danger, and added the, whole, uh, the El Masri sequence in the film mm -hmm. last, uh, you know, last summer. So we had, we, we've been through this process. And I think after five years, um, I think now the idea of adding other things to the film fills me with horror. <laughs> I think what you see is what you get here yeah. now. <laughs> well, there's certainly aspects of the film that I think fill us with horror, and mm -hmm. I think that means its, uh, its job is in large part uh, done. So thank you all so much thank for you. Thank you.